You can forgive all of them. Make them see they made a mistake. Make them understand. I can't. Okay, so I'm back. And we have to talk about toxic fandom. Since season 8 ended, the internet's been flooded with countless takes on the ending of Game of Thrones. From fans insisting they know the story better than the writers, to a petition demanding reshoots, it's clear that reactions are mixed. And while criticism is important, I think that if we want to be critical of media, we should also be critical of our own opinions. So, in light of some of the extreme reactions we've been seeing, the, wor the worst finale episode in the history of television, I'm going to say we need to take a step back as a culture and take a look at ourselves. So, this kind of reaction isn't really exclusive to Game of Thrones. Fandoms actually have a history of toxic backlash when things don't go their way. It wasn't long ago that pretty much every YouTube video was an angry rant about how Ryan Johnson ruined Star Wars. More recently, we've seen some really extreme reactions to the trailers for the new Cats and the live-action Sonic the Hedgehog. Or way back in 1982, when it was leaked that Spock would die in The Wrath of Khan, Trekkies blamed Leonard Nimoy and even sent him death threats. Just last year, The Last Jedi's Kelly Marie Tran was bullied off social media because fanboys didn't like the character of Rose. Now look, I know we all have a right to our opinion, and I realize negative opinions are not the same as bullying. But I do have to ask, how much of this is constructive? Do people understand the thing they're criticizing? And are we maybe overreacting? Part 1 what if we're overreacting? It's hard to talk about fandoms without generalizing people, because everyone responds to a story in their own way. Some people loved the ending, some hated it, some hated the ideas, and others hated the way they were executed. Obviously, not everything I say can apply to every single person. So in order to be objective, I'm going to be a nerd and start with some graphs. Looking at the data, there seems to be a distinct sense from the critical community that Game of Thrones fell apart in the last three or four episodes. Before that, the show was mostly a critical hit. But was this sudden drop in scores actually fair? For me, the show had been struggling for years to depict organic character development and realistic politics. And to be frank, the books Game of Thrones is based on are way too dense and expansive to be accurately adapted to television. The problems so many had with the ending are problems I've been seeing for a while now, and so I'd come to look at the show as kind of a preview for the books. While I understand people's frustration with certain sloppily handled twists, I'm also kind of just over it and prefer to focus more on the core ideas. Like, what does the ending say about moral certitude and the glorification of war? Or about power, redemption, and choice? In the backlash, these bigger discussions aren't really being had. Yet, the showrunners that fans are now calling Dumb and Dumber are the same ones who've been writing the show since season one, and had been receiving critical acclaim well after they passed the books, as we saw with episodes like Battle of the Bastards and The Winds of Winter. The good act does not wash out the bad, nor a bad the good. Though many repeat the mantra that the problem isn't what happened, it's how it was executed. I don't think that sentiment captures the full story behind the backlash. And that's not to say that everything was well executed, but to say that for several years, fans have been forgiving and even applauding sloppy writing because they liked what was happening. For example, the resolution of the Slaver's base storyline and the Battle of the Bastards aren't really set up much better than anything in Season 8. They just have more popular outcomes. What changed in the last three episodes is that the outcomes got controversial. For example, many believed that defeating the Night King was Jon's whole arc, and insist that Jon was robbed of his destiny. But even before he encountered the White Walkers, Jon's conflict was always framed as love versus duty, the human heart in conflict with itself. His arc is about making difficult choices, not accomplishing great feats. And in that, John is still a chosen hero. It's just that his heroism isn't supposed to be cool or honorable or even triumphant. The point is that doing the right thing isn't always totally awesome. 
That kind of subversion is classic Game of Thrones. I mean, if we look to the beginning, Ned's arc seemed to be going south to become Hand of the King and solve the mystery of Jon Arryn's murder. Yet, not only does Ned die, he also never figures out who the real killer was. The true arc was Ned's inner struggle, and like Jon, the legacy of his actions on the world isn't immediately apparent. Ask me again in 10 years. Not all, but so many of the complaints around the final season come down to some form of, this isn't what I expected. From the belief that the Night King was the true threat, to the belief that Jon would sit the Iron Throne, to the belief that Jaime's ending would be more heroic. Which leads us to question, why did the audience have the expectations they did? And what is it about subverted expectations that's so hard to accept? Part 2. What if Game of Thrones was never meant to be popular? Throughout its eight-year run, Game of Thrones became what can only be described as a landmark television drama, pushing the limits of what a show could accomplish in terms of scope and story, and gaining popularity approaching that of Star Wars, Harry Potter, or the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Simply put, the show reached mainstream status, which is complicated. So for those who don't know, Game of Thrones is based on this series of gritty fantasy novels by George R. R. Martin, who'd previously been known for writing really weird niche sci-fi, filled with telepathic hive minds, body snatching, and space Catholicism. The books, as well as the early seasons, trade out straightforward character arcs and cathartic victories for messy, soul-crushing realism. I say this to point out that unlike Star Wars, Harry Potter, or the MCU, Martin's story was probably never meant to be a big crowd pleaser. But with the growing popularity of the show, season 6 and 7 saw Benioff and Weiss shift gears to a more mainstream narrative. There were probably a lot of reasons for this, some business related, others to do with the challenges of adaptation. But the story that once built up Joffrey as a villain for four seasons, only to have him poisoned by a relatively minor character, became the show that gave every victory to the fan favorite character that most wanted it. So of course people expected Jon and Danny to achieve their goals together. Of course they expected Jaime to save King's Landing from Cersei. They just watched Sansa execute her rapist, and Arya assassinate everyone who took part in the Red Wedding, and Grey Worm kill the Slave Masters, and the Stark kids avenge their dad. Suddenly, we were being given a steady stream of good triumphing over evil, and people were eating it up. So when we got to the messy George R. R. Martin conclusion, audiences were jarred by the lack of cathartic victory. Thus came a flood of emotions from the fandom. People were upset by the execution and content of what happened, and it became hard to draw the line where one feeling ended and the other began. So, people stopped looking past flaws in the show's execution like they used to, and instead fixated on them directly. After all, people don't need much justification for stuff like John is King now, or Danny is finally coming to Westeros, like they do for Jaime goes back to Cersei. We actually saw this already with Stannis Baratheon, whose tragic ending received highly polarized reactions depending on whether or not viewers had high hopes for the character with his fans accusing the showrunners of intentional character assassination. And what happened with Stannis is now happening on a much larger scale, with much more popular characters. While we can say that the tragedies of Ned, Catelyn, and Rob were better set up, it's also important to recognize that, thanks to online spoilers, most people knew those characters were doomed within a month of starting the show. So those deaths didn't really betray people's idea of who those characters were or shatter their expectations for what the story was supposed to be. Take the new Star Wars movies. The Force Awakens contains scenes which bait its audience to wonder about stuff like Rey's parents or Snoke's origins. But since Disney never had a big picture plan for those plot threads, Ryan Johnson decided they weren't narratively important and ditched them in The Last Jedi. This made sense for his vision, but was a bummer for fan theorists who'd spent two years building their own headcanons around those questions. Due to its emphasis on prophecy and mystery, Game of Thrones actually engages in way more of this kind of theory baiting, with a fan community that's built on piles of online theory discussions. For millions, speculating about Game of Thrones was a key part of enjoying it. 
Trust me, as a guy who once wrote a weirdly popular fan theory about Bran possessing Jon's dead body, I know how it is. And while that speculation was key to bringing together a dedicated fandom, it also led to fans taking an unwarranted sense of ownership over the story. To get even deeper into it, various fan communities even developed vastly different headcanons, and would ridicule each other over their wildly different, and as it turns out, equally incorrect, expectations. So, people have difficulty accepting that John's parentage is meant to subvert the secret lineage trope, revealing it to be a burden rather than a solution, or accepting that the Night King being defeated before the end is meant to reframe the Dark Lord trope, from being an external evil to an internal consequence of the pursuit of power, or accepting that Jamie's story is an exploration of the limits of redemption arcs. But we also have to bear in mind that Martin came up with this stuff in the 90s, well before the internet had developed into what it is today. So we can't blame him for not expecting fans to come to the conclusions that they did. But it's fan entitlement that causes literally 100% of misunderstanding being blamed on the writers. At no point are most people accepting that they might have been wrong about anything. This is because people have projected their own ideas of where the story was headed onto the world and characters, and interpreted everything based on those expectations. Basically, I'm saying that people tend to forgive a story that's sloppily done if it gives them what they wanted. But those same people get hypercritical if a story subverts their expectations in a way that's upsetting. Which brings me to my first ever YouTube callout. I'm sure a lot of you have seen Think Story's How Game of Thrones Should Have Ended. In this video, Think Story recites his fanfiction of how the story should have played out abandoning everything subversive, and instead just playing out all the most popular fan theories. Jaime kills Cersei, Bran gets stuck in the Night King's memories, Jon makes the big sacrifice and is remembered as a hero king, and Queen Dany carries forward his legacy. And of course, this video was wildly popular even though it ditches the tough questions Martin asks about war and power, and just offers a conformist fanfiction about heroes saving the world from Ice Thanos. So think story, Thank you for being such a perfect example of mediocrity. I bring this up because it exposes the entitlement of fandom. Like, I enjoyed Endgame as much as the next guy, but not everything has to be Endgame. Not every story has to please the mainstream. That's not what Game of Thrones was ever supposed to be. In a world where stories so often fail due to corporate greed, or a lack of creativity, or pandering too hard to a particular demographic, Game of Thrones is actually being punished for the opposite. It's being punished for keeping to the artistic vision of its author. Part 3. What if I'm wrong? Okay, so I've made some harsh claims. I've said that a lot of people's reactions are being driven by their attachment to an incorrect idea of what the story was supposed to be. As in, I believe the story was always going to have Jamie choose to die with Cersei, Danny burn King's Landing, John exiled to the Night's Watch, and Bran chosen as king. That's the story Martin was always telling, and for the most part, anything else would have been untrue to it. But what if I'm wrong? Wrong about what's driving people's anger, or wrong about the story Martin is telling, or wrong about what's good? What about everyone else? All the other people who think they know what's good. Though my channel has become most widely known for predicting that Bran would be king, I have to admit that over the years I've had a ton of theories, and most of them ended up being wrong. Yet, every time, I was so sure that I'd figure things out, that I knew what was good and what the story was supposed to be. Truth is, I've always been a little too certain that I'm right about things, and that's something that I've always had to work on, and maybe so do a lot of us. And if you notice, that was a big part of the message of Game of Thrones there at the end, that maybe in the process of being so certain that you know what's good, you aren't doing anyone any good. Maybe people are out here pointing out plot holes while missing one of the key messages the show tried to deliver, that it's destructive to be so stuck in our own perspective that we stop trying to understand. I mean, does this kind of backlash really benefit anyone? You know, probably not. I think this need to direct all of our anger at a particular person when we feel let down tends to miss the bigger picture. With Game of Thrones, it's Benioff and Weiss, 
even though there are much bigger structural issues with adapting A Song of Ice and Fire into a television format. I mean, George R. R. Martin himself splits the story in half for books four and five, a strategy which would have been impossible to do with a television show. Also, he throws in a bunch more characters, and he's spent the last eight years writing the sixth book. Meanwhile, D&D had to not only condense the story, but do it in a fraction of the time. People call them out on rushing the story, but they went one season beyond their initial plan and spent an entire two years on the final six episodes. They made mistakes, yes, but they did so because they had a hard job. Alternatively, with The Last Jedi, everyone's villain was Ryan Johnson, despite there being much bigger structural issues with the way Disney brought back Star Wars. Yet the backlash over The Last Jedi didn't push Disney to re-examine the broader problems with their trilogy. It just bullied some people and pushed them back to J.J. Abrams, whose idea of a Star Wars movie was just a retelling of A New Hope. Ultimately, fan backlash didn't stop the milking of Star Wars. It just invited more shameless pandering. This is kind of an obvious statement, but television and film is largely driven by the market. And so what gets made will typically be what can reliably turn a profit. On account of just how much goes into shows and movies today, studios avoid taking risks, leading to our current age of remakes, reboots, and adaptations. When we punish stories that try to be subversive, we're implicitly telling studios to keep playing it safe. So, for better or worse, I appreciate when people have the courage to try something different. We need more different. Frankly, we need more weird. I think you're making a terrible mistake. (laughs) The freedom to make my own mistakes was all I ever wanted. Which brings me back to the petition and maybe my most controversial point. In a recent interview, actor Nikolai Kosterwaldo joked that the final season of Game of Thrones would be remade once the million people who signed the petition could all agree on an ending. And while he makes a great point about how it's impossible to appease every headcanon out there, I do want to challenge his point just a little bit, because I actually think it would have been easy to make an ending that was better received than the one we got. Which is actually why David Benioff and D.B. Weiss deserve some credit. It would have been easy for them to abandon Martin's vision and do a crowd-pleasing ending that people were expecting. Have Jon sword fight the Night King, have Jaime heroically kill Cersei, have Danny install democracy, and then fly off into the sunset with Jon. An ending like that isn't hard to come up with. After all, that sort of fanservice-y wish fulfillment is pretty much exactly what they wrote for Battle of the Bastards, and it received widespread acclaim. Seriously, people, the last two episodes of Season 6 are not well written. People just liked watching the heroes win. So despite everything, I respect D&D for trying. For doing a final season that took big risks. Do I think it was great? No. But it was ambitious, and to me, that's more important. Now of course, of course, there are things I would have done differently. Characters I don't think were handled well, and valid criticisms to make. But we should consider that for everything the showrunners might have gotten wrong, there were probably a ton of things we had wrong too. And instead of obsessing over plot holes, maybe our energy would be better spent trying to reach a better understanding. And appreciating that despite being really flawed, the ending we got was genuine, not focus grouped or test marketed, but an attempt to explore some tough questions about who we are. Which is why we should forgive Game of Thrones. Although I can't tell anyone how to feel, I can suggest that we also be self-critical. Though I can't necessarily tell people what ideals to live by, I do suggest we try to understand the ideals present in the media we consume, and then make a choice whether or not to apply those messages in our own lives. And though it's up to each of us to choose what we like and what we can forgive, maybe we owe it to ourselves, when our favorite stories let us down, to remember all of the things that made them our favorite stories in the first place.